The word lens is derived from a Latin word, lens, which is Latin for lentil. This name was applied to the object to which it was applied, because if you look at a double convex lens, that is a lens that bows outward in the middle on both sides, if you look at such a lens side on, it is shaped kind of like a lentil is shaped. There is some evidence that lenses in various forms, made of various materials and used for various applications, have been around for perhaps thousands of years, maybe even as far back as the 7th century BC, a time period from whence a polished rock crystal, sometimes called the Nimrud lens because of where it was discovered, a place in Iraq, formerly called Nimrud, back in the region's Assyrian days, but which is also sometimes called the Layard Lens, which is a name derived from its discoverer, an English archaeologist, world traveler, cuneiform expert, politician, beer maker, and all-around interesting fellow named Austin Henry Layard. He discovered this stone and posited, alongside other experts, that it may have been used as a light-focusing lens, meant to capture sunlight, focus it to a point, and as a consequence, start fires. There's also a chance that it was used as a magnifying lens by craftsmen working on fine details in their metalwork to ensure that they could clearly see the intricate illustrations that they were etching into their products. There is a decent amount of doubt about this and other contemporary maybe lenses from this period, including those that were maybe used by ancient Egyptians. So keep that in mind when you hear talk about lenses being around for that duration. It's not a certain thing, even if it's kind of neat to think about. But historians are a lot more certain about the intent and use cases for the highly polished lens-like stones produced by the Greeks, because they not only produced these lens-like objects, they also wrote about them as tools, but also as plot devices in some of their dramas. A play by Aristophanes, for instance, called The Clouds, written in 424 BC, mentions a lens that was used to set things alight. And the earliest known mention of lenses used to correct eyesight may have been mentioned in Pliny the Elder's work, The Natural History, when he talks about Emperor Nero of Rome watching gladiatorial matches through an emerald, which it is guessed, but not known from the context of this writing, was probably concave in shape, which would have corrected for nearsightedness, and therefore allowed him to see the gladiator match more clearly than he could have unaided. A great deal of early optical work comes from the Islamic world, which at the time was kicking some serious ass when it came to mathematics and broad-based scientific research. As a result, a lot of our understanding of our ancient forebearers' understanding of optics comes from what we today call the Middle East. And although some of the most famous works on this subject back before the Renaissance, like Alhazar's Book of Optics from the 11th century, were based on work done by far earlier Greeks, like Ptolemy's book entitled simply Optics, in some cases, as with Ptolemy's optics, the only reason we know about these Greek works to begin with is because they were read and translated and copied and preserved and protected by the Islamic world, whose scholars read and thought and came up with their own more advanced and complete versions of what was being discussed hundreds of years prior elsewhere in places like Greece. Between the 11th and 13th centuries, so-called reading stones were invented and made available to the masses throughout Eurasia. Reading stones were kind of like a tiny magnifying glass. They were little transparent rocks you would hold over something that you wished to see more clearly, and the warping of that stone would magnify what was beneath it. So if you were reading a text with words that you could not see because of bad eyesight, you could put one of these stones over the text and it would magnify the words, making them clearer and easier to perceive and consume. These stones were a direct precursor to spectacles, which were being made in northern Italy, in Pisa, or thereabouts, by around 1290 AD. We have that specific of a date because a friar in Pisa wrote on February 23rd, 
1306, about meeting the person who first discovered the craft of making eyeglasses and who began to make them and make them available in the area, and how it had not yet been 20 years since that craft began to be performed. So at least according to this friar's knowledge on the matter, that was the proper time period, give or take a year or two. And a friend of this friar's, who was also a friar, began making eyeglasses as well soon after that. So it would seem that some unnamed person started producing eyeglasses in Pisa around 1290, and then the craft began to spread like wildfire. There were even guild-based regulations in place governing the sale of eyeglasses by the year 1301. Glasses began to show up in portraits in the mid-14th century. In 1352, Tommaso da Modena's painting of a cardinal named Hugh de Provence shows this cardinal reading and writing while wearing eyeglasses. And from that point forward, we begin to see them all over the place, especially on portraits of religious people, as they were still the ones doing the majority of the reading and writing in the region at that time. The invention of eyeglasses has been placed in many different regions over the years, but none of those claims seem to hold as much water as the Pisa connection upon further inspection. It's possible that the invention of modern eyeglasses actually did happen in northern Italy around 1290, but it's also possible that someone else in that area tooled around with reading stones and made their own, and this 1290 innovation was mostly just an innovation of scale setting up a shop that sells these things to the public, rather than producing one-off jobs that folks produced for themselves. It's also possible that this innovation came from elsewhere, or many different elsewheres, and this Italian producer of eyeglasses was just the first to arrive in a place that also contained someone who was interested enough to write about this invention that, no doubt, many people in many places around the world at the time saw as being superfluous. Because, again, the majority of people who acquired this product were those who needed to read and write on a regular basis. And throughout most of the world at this point in history, those who could do these things were few and far between. And the amount of knowledge and work required to produce even unsophisticated lenses back then, to polish the right stones in the right way before building frames for them that could cling to the bridge of one's nose reliably, that put these devices in a price bracket that was substantially higher than what the everyday person could easily afford. What I want to talk about today is the eyeglass industry, how it has evolved over the generations, and what is happening in this space today, inside an old industry that has been altered by all kinds of innovations and challenges over the past several decades. <music> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also contribute via PayPal or Venmo and services like that. You can find links to those options at letsnotethings.com. And also incredibly helpful is leaving a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Contributions of any shape or size or type makes all the difference in the world. I truly appreciate it. I truly appreciate you. It's these sorts of things that allow me to continue to put as much effort into this project as I do. So thank you very much to everyone who's already contributed in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from the LA Times, and it's entitled, Why Are Glasses So Expensive? The Eyewear Industry Prefers to Keep That Blurry. Now, I'll say ahead of time that this is not the best piece of journalism that I've ever read, and that's in part because of the editorialized tone that it takes. It's more of a column than a serious piece of neutral investigative journalism. And it's partly because the author was not able to get much in the way of original reporting done. Though to be fair, that's because the entities involved would not comment on the record about anything that he asked them about. But it is a good entry point to something that I've been curious about for a long time, but only recently started looking into. 
namely the costs associated with the eye care and eye wear industries. And part of why this world is so fascinating is that, like the world of dentistry, which is itself also quite interesting, this is a space that is often kept separate from other facets of healthcare. And it's not clear why that's the case, at least in pure biological medical terms. First, a little background. There are many variations of eye and eye-like organs found throughout the natural world. Some eyes, for instance, are compound eyes, meaning they're made up of thousands of little eye units called amatidia, which are bundles of cornea, lens, and photoreceptor packages that allow the primarily insect and crustacean, and some types of fish, which have these types of eyes, to stitch together a bunch of different bits of photon-delivered data from each of these little bundles. The benefits of such eyes is that they give their owner a very large viewing angle, and it allows them to detect very small, very fast movements. But when it comes to clarity and resolution, non-compound eyes are a whole lot more useful. Now, a non-compound eye is a type of photon receptor package that has seemingly independently evolved several times in several different types of creature, from vertebrates, like us humans, to cephalopods, like octopuses, to crustaceans, like lobsters, and cubozoa, like box jellyfish, which, unlike some of their jellyfish brethren, have complete non-compound eye setups, kind of like we do. As you might expect from that variety of eye bearers, though, there is a great deal of variation between the different sorts of non-compound eyes that we have found in nature. There are pit eyes, for instance, which are relatively simple spots on the surface of an organism that allow them to see using similar but simpler components compared to those found in other types of non-compound eyes. Then there's the far more complex human eye, which has three layers of eye pieces, starting with the fibrous tunic on the outside, which contains the cornea and sclera, the former being the transparent layer that covers the surface of the eye, the latter being what is often referred to as the white of the eye, to the middle layer, which is called the vascular tunic, which contains the choroid, the ciliary body, the pigmented epithelium, and the iris which are, in order, the connective tissues between the retina and the sclera, the muscle that expands and contracts the lens and regulates the plasma-like liquid on the surface of your eye, the colorful part of the eye, and the iris controls the shape of the pupil, which controls how much light gets into your photoreceptive cells. And then finally, the innermost layer of the human eye contains the retina, which is the light-sensitive surface of the eye, and which is fueled by blood vessels from behind the eyeball and by the retinal vessels that you can see on top of the eyeball. The eyeball, as a complete unit, is actually not spherical, despite what the label ball might imply, but is instead composed of two core chunks that are fused together, and the size of the eyeball is surprisingly similar across all of humankind, regardless of background genetics and so on. Pretty much all human eyes, with very few exceptions, are about 24 millimeters vertical, about 24.2 millimeters across, and about 23.7 millimeters deep. That's a little less than an inch in all directions, 0.94 inches by 0.95 inches by 0.93 inches, respectively. Other animals have similar setups to ours, but have different strengths and weaknesses based on evolutionary priority, historical accident, or just plain happenstance. Dogs, for instance, have more rods in their retinas, while we have more cones. Rods are photoreceptor cells that help with seeing in low-light conditions, while cones help us perceive well-lit, colorful objects. As such, dogs have somewhat better night vision than we do, while we have somewhat better color perception than they do. Likewise, most birds have far keener eyesight than we humans do, but they cannot move their eyes, with very few exceptions. And we have overall more versatile vision in more situations. Birds tend to have very specialized eyes based on their eating habits and environments, whereas humans have evolved eyes that have allowed us to be more versatile, if less perfectly optimal, in both regards. The evolution of the eye has proved to be very interesting for biologists because we understand the fundamental components and have seen simple light detection sensory organs in bacteria, in plants, and even in some single-celled organisms. 
But we've also seen complex eyes of different sorts evolve at different times in seemingly disparate groups. So it's not an unusual combination of elements, evolutionarily, that lead to the eyes. We've also seen creatures evolve eyes only to evolve them away later. This has been especially true of certain types of newt and cave salamander that evolved from above-ground ancestors, but which at some point started living primarily underground and rerouted some of the energy that they were spending on eyes and vision to their other senses that better served them in their new, lightless habitats. All of which is to say, eyes are complex and interesting, but also fairly fundamental to many species. Now, there are plenty of humans who get along just fine without the ability to see, but a lot of human society, particularly modern human society, is oriented around encoded written language and other visually perceived glyphs, which means there are still gaps in our communication when it comes to folks who either can't see well or cannot see at all. The solutions that have been invented to aid those who cannot see at all are really cool and very fascinating, but on this episode, we'll be talking more specifically about those that have been invented for folks who have not great eyesight. Folks like me, who wear contact lenses and or glasses, and who are able to see with immensely better clarity as a consequence of these tools. The segment of the healthcare world that revolves around our eyes is run by optometrists, ophthalmic opticians, or folks with similar titles. The labels vary a bit around the world, but these are the people who diagnose and treat eye-related and other visual ailments and disorders, and who divvy out prescriptions if it turns out that the best solution is putting some kind of lens over our photoreceptors. Part of the reason we have so many titles within this industry these days, is that over the years, the scope of the optometry world has expanded to overlap with the world of ophthalmology, the former being the examining and treating of eyes and visual systems, the latter being typically more focused on the treatment and surgery of those same systems. In many places, and this is true in the U.S. as well, Ophthalmologists are medical doctors with the many years of school and residency required of any other medical doctor, while optometrists get their OD, their doctorate of optometry, which requires four years of school. So it's a lot more focused and requires a lot less general medical training, but is still a significant amount of education. Opticians, who you will typically meet at optometrist offices or other places that sell glasses, are technicians who can help you get the right fit when it comes to your glasses. They can help you learn to put in and care for your contact lenses, and they can do some tests to check your eyesight and eye health, but they are limited in what they can sign off on and they generally cannot give you a prescription. Eyeglasses prescribed by folks in this facet of the medical world work on the principle that you can put a shaped, transparent surface between your eye and whatever it is that you're trying to see to warp the light before it hits your eye in a way that is favorable to your visual limitations. So if you're nearsighted, if you see things close to your face pretty well, but things off in the distance are blurry as hell, your eye is either too long or less commonly, your eyeball-based lens is too strong. And you can ameliorate this issue in a lot of cases by bending the light so that it hits the eye in a more normal way. So that the downsides of those elongated eyeballs are countered by bending the light so that it hits those eye surfaces in the same way it would if your eyes were not elongated. The same is true of folks who are farsighted, able to see things far away better than up close. The light is bent in a different way, but the purpose is the same to correct for an issue in the eye by favorably warping the light to allow the wearer to perceive that light and the information it grants them as if they did not have that issue. And that, albeit a bit meanderingly, brings us back to that article in the LA Times. The crux of the piece is that the eyewear industry, the folks who sell us glasses, are reluctant to provide numbers about their trade because the profit margins are absolutely massive. And implicitly, if more people knew how much they were paying for glasses and associated items above what it costs to make those glasses and associated items, it would not look good for those who are currently profiting off the sale of these products. The article provides us with some interesting stats that outline what's happening in this space right now. First is that about three-fourths of adults 
in the U.S. and most of the wealthy world use some sort of vision correction product. And about two-thirds of those people wear glasses. That's about 126 million people just in the U.S. who are customers for these products, with similar proportions elsewhere based on regional population. And it's estimated that in the non-wealthy countries where they don't have as much data about this for a variety of reasons, those numbers would be similar. So that is an absolutely massive demographic to have as a potential customer base. The average cost of a pair of frames, again in the U.S., is about $231, according to a report by a leading provider of employer eye care benefits. And the average cost of a pair of single vision lenses, which means non-bifocal lenses, is about $112, though bifocal lenses often run twice that on average. Now here's the kicker. The average cost to produce a pair of frames which again, on average in the U.S. is about $231. It only costs them about $10 to make. That is a huge profit margin. And although there wasn't any numerical data about this in that article, and although finding exact numbers was a little bit tricky, in part because many of the available resources are written by and closely guarded by the industry that is producing and selling these products, the most legitimate number I was able to find for the cost to produce a pair of lenses for your glasses is on the low end, without any fancy stuff, about $4. And that number was actually from 2008. So there's a decent chance that the cost to produce the lenses that go in your glasses, at least for the ultra basic model, is cheaper than $4 today. Most of these lenses are just plastic, fabricated in bulk, using machines, no human attention or interaction required. So it makes sense that at a certain scale, the cost of making them would approach the cost of just the plastic and electricity used by the machine. So $14 on the low end to produce a pair of glasses, and the average cost for a pair at the store is about $343 for single vision lenses and frames. And that's if you're not getting designer frames or ultra high-end lenses with all the latest glazes and tints and bifocal capabilities. And one way to look at this information is to say, okay, well, fair enough. The industry has managed to build themselves a desirable, useful product that we would be way worse off not having. And they're continuing to improve upon that product, probably using some of those profits. And that's why we keep on seeing all of these new styles and tints, the seamless bifocals and lenses that transition between regular glasses and sunglasses. It's not ideal that I have to pay so much for something that costs them relatively little to make. But that's kind of how most industries work, right? It's only fair. And that is one legitimate assessment of what is happening here from some perspectives, though it glosses over a few interesting details that may or may not change the tone of this conversation, if you know about them. One such point is that the majority of this space, especially at the middle and high end of the industry, is owned by a single company. Luxottica Group SPA is an eyewear company out of Milan, Italy, that designs, manufactures, distributes, and sells its own products. It's vertically integrated, so it controls the whole idea-to-final-sale flow of product and its associated services. And it does this via its various brands, which include Lens Crafters, Sunglass Hut, Pearl Vision, Sears Optical, Target Optical, Glasses.com, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and many others. They also make sunglasses and prescription glasses frames for all kinds of high-end brands, from Chanel and Prada and Armani to DKNY, Dolce & Gabbana, and Burberry. In mid-2018, a merger between Luxottica and Essilor, a French company that developed and owns, among others, the Transitions brand and technology, which allows glasses to turn into sunglasses when exposed to sunlight, this merger was approved by the European Commission, which resulted in a new holding company, Essilor Luxottica, which has a combined retail capitalization of about 57 billion euros, employs about 140,000 people, sells nearly a billion pairs of lenses and frames each year worldwide, and has become, now unified, what some eyewear business owners are calling a, quote, category killer an entity that so thoroughly dominates an industry that said industry becomes all but inaccessible to outside influence or competition, including those that might innovate or help alleviate the issues inherent in an industry ruled by a monopoly. 
including the high prices and systemic stagnation that tend to emerge given enough time with a monopolist in control. You could look at the eyewear industry then and see it as an owned space, immune to disruption, which is a little less ideal, I think, even to folks who tend to believe that they are earning all of those profits that they've carved out for themselves and should be able to continue to do so. So it's a complicated monolithic industry that is forming. But if you look a little closer, you will still see some small cracks in that burgeoning, hardening, monopolistic wall. The last time I bought glasses, I used a service with an unremarkable, almost scammy sounding name, the type of company that names themselves after their web address, I think. And I think I paid somewhere in the neighborhood of $30. It could have been closer to $20, but I added on a few options, like smaller, less thick lenses, scratch resistance, and an anti-reflective coating. The frames were similarly unremarkable, which is what I wanted, actually. No logos, nothing flashy, which is kind of more my style anyway. And all told, shipping included, it was about $30. I ended up buying another backup pair for about the same price a few months later. And neither pair is the highest-end product I've ever owned, but I don't particularly need glasses that look like the facial equivalent of a Cadillac and that scream at anyone within squinting distance that I spent a grand for these things that I sometimes wear when I don't have my contacts in. That price point, $30, is available in part because someone was able to recognize the brand value gap in this industry, a gap that is perpetuated by the near monopoly that Essilor Luxottica enjoys, along with the perception that glasses, particularly prescription glasses, but also sunglasses at times, are expensive, are things that you are meant to spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on. It's difficult to directly compare the quality of these sorts of things. But the comparison that comes to mind for me here is the difference between flying coach and flying business class when you travel on a plane. Whatever seat you occupy on the plane, you're getting from point A to point B. You're being whisked through the air. Fuel is being expended to get you there. Duties and fees are being paid by the airline to taxi into the gate. And paychecks are being issued to the flight attendants, the pilots, and so on. The level of service, amount of space available for your legs, the overall quality of the food and other accoutrements are way different. Business class is great if someone else is paying for it. And it bears the moniker that it does because typically it is someone's expense account that takes the hit, not their own wallet. Business class is almost always a business-related expense. The same is true to some degree of the eyewear industry. The $1,000 pair of glasses emblazoned with some designer logo, the quality of the metal and glazes on the frames made with somewhat better materials, they are the business class of the optical world. The $30 pair that I bought are Coach, and like Coach seats on most airlines, they are not horrible. They still do pretty much everything that they need to do, at least fundamentally the things that the higher-end options do. So what you're really paying for when you aim for that higher-end option are all the little upgrades. It's the wine with your meals, the extended legroom, the fancier glazes on the lenses, the luxury-associated logos on the frames. It's convenient, too, for this metaphor, that there's an expense account of sorts in the eyewear industry in some parts of the world as well, in the shape of insurance companies, or in some cases, government programs that pay for part or all of one's eyewear expenditures. Now, this isn't something that most people have here in the United States for a variety of reasons, chief among them that we have just a really backwards insurance system that leaves a lot of people out in the cold. But eye care is a privilege that some enjoy even here. And when you've got it, You've also usually got X number of dollars that you can spend on glasses each year or every couple of years if you choose to. So why wouldn't you? If you don't use it, you lose it. So why not pick up a pricier pair of frames, max out that money that you have available through your insurance if you have the option? There is a shift occurring here, though, represented in this case by the availability of stripped down serviceable and not super expensive frames. And this move is part of a larger movement that is happening within the healthcare industry in general here in the United States. Because so many people pay out of pocket for healthcare services in this country, the fact that hospitals and clinics and other service providers often have opaque as hell offerings can be devastating to a person's financial well-being. 
What that means in practice is that you can show up to a hospital for a quick checkup and then somehow be charged $3,000, some of which is no doubt for the doctor's time, some that is maybe for the tests that they ran, some that is maybe for a bandage that it, they put on a scrape or something like that. But you don't really have any way of knowing what those costs will be ahead of time. At times, you can't even get an answer up front if you think to ask, because the folks working at these service providers themselves do not always see the full expanse of variables that affect your final tally until they're all added together and presented to you as a bill. Hospitals and other providers argue that this allows them to negotiate with insurance companies to ensure they provide lower prices to insurers and the insured, because they more or less buy these services in bulk. Now that's fine in some ways if you are getting these costs covered, but what often happens in practice is that providers bulk up their prices knowing that the insurers will pay for them regardless, or in some cases they will fluff up the prices before discounting them for the insurers, leaving those who do not benefit from those negotiations, paying astronomical prices that no sane person would pay if they could avoid doing so. This is a method similar to what some retailers do before they put items on sale. They make it look like that item was more expensive the week before, so that when they mark it down to that usual price, it seems in comparison like a deal, and they can label it as such. As of 2019, hospitals and other service providers in the United States have to, by law, display their prices for common procedures and services so that folks can make more informed decisions about where they spend their money and what they'll be paying for ahead of time. Now, the setup is still new, and the prices provided are a mess and consequently difficult to comparison shop for, like you would for shoes or a computer. But maybe someday, hopefully, it'll help push these prices down a bit for surgeries and casts, but also for checkups and eye exams. For the moment, though, what seems to be happening in the world of optical health is that inflated eyewear prices, though still safe and sound in their own often brick-and-mortar retail centers, are being challenged primarily in the world of online commerce. Optometrists, or your local equivalent, usually have to, by law, provide you with your prescription after they do their tests. And you can then take that prescription to wherever you'd like to fill it to get glasses or contact lenses that suit your needs and price point. But in many places, the spots we go to get these checkups to get our prescriptions also have their own glasses and contacts available for sale on site. And at times, that leads to the hard sell from the doctor, someone whose job it is to check out your eyes and help you keep them healthy and help you see better, but who is also, because of this setup, economically incentivized to push you to buy from them, to pay those higher in-person monopoly prices, because then they get your money, rather than some nameless, faceless online entity that would charge you one-tenth as much. In many places around the world, including here in the United States, prescriptions of this kind are required if you want to order glasses or contact lenses. Ensuring your eyes are healthy and that you can see clearly is considered to be important enough that it is legally tricky to just go and buy some prescription glasses without first forking out somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 to get your eyes checked, if you haven't done so in the last year or so, at least. And because of this, we're seeing competition in the prescription-giving space as well. Warby Parker, the ostensibly cheaper but really more of a middle-end glasses option, who sell what amount to designer glasses that are not marked up as much as the monopolist options, they provide a service through an app that they built that allows you to take an eye test to get your prescription from your phone. A few other sites do versions of this as well, some of which fall into the very cheap category and some of which are middle-end competitors like Warby Parker. These digital options have not been around long enough to determine if they're actually suitable replacements for the in-person checkup. I personally have tried a few of them myself, and most of them have proven to be a little bit wonky, maybe a little bit glitchy, and in some cases they just give up and tell you that they are not going to work on your particular phone or computer, and that you'll need to go in and get a checkup with one of the optometrists that they recommend instead. In a lot of cases, too, they will then pressure you to buy from them after you go through this process. So they're using this supposedly free prescription offer to get you to commit to buying from their catalog rather than their potentially cheaper competitors, which in some cases may actually make sense once you add up all the numbers, but it is interesting to see how the regulations in this space are being used as marketing gimmicks.
It'll be interesting to see what happens in the world of eyewear, in part because of its connection to that larger healthcare industry, and in part because the components are so relatively simple and cheap to make, but a lot of the perceived value is in things other than the actual practical purpose of the hardware. If you wear glasses primarily to see, then you have more options than ever, and a little shopping around may substantially decrease your eyewear costs compared to what you were paying 10 years ago. On the other hand, it may be that your eyewear is about more than just seeing clearly and having something on your face that doesn't look terrible. Maybe it's more about image, about association, about brand and brand perception. And if that's the case, the eyewear monopoly has yet to be fully surpassed. They are kind of the only name in the game for those priorities. Though it may be that sometime in the relatively near future, we will see more openness in the pricing of the procedures and checkups at least, and perhaps even the eyewear products themselves. If we continue to see more transparency in terms of what things cost and what they cost to make and what the competition looks like, that could be enough to force the current monopoly to work a little bit harder to maintain their place on the face-based seeing stone throne. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, one way to support my work more broadly is to purchase one of the books that I've written. You can find a complete list of those, both fiction and nonfiction, at colin.io. You can also help support my work by coming out to one of the events that I am holding currently. I am on tour at the moment, traveling around North America, and you can find out more about the events, the talk that I'm giving, where I will be and when, and how to get your tickets if applicable at becomingtour.com. The TV series that I'd like to recommend today is one that just recently came out in the United States, though it's been out elsewhere for several weeks or months now. The show is called Black Earth Rising, and it is a fairly intense intellectual thriller, I think I'd call it. There is some physical action involved, but a whole lot of the drama and intrigue is found in the dialogue and in the storyline. And the show is about the Rwandan genocide. And part of why the show is so good is that it has a great deal of nuance. This is not a one-sided view. This is a show that demonstrates multiple perspectives and does not give you a single satisfying answer. It does not give you a single villain. It does not give you a single person to love and a single person to hate. The show itself is very well written. The acting is incredible. I happen to know with good authority that the lead actress, Michaela Cole, is a listener of this show. Hey, Michaela. But most vital is the quality of the show, the fact that it portrays a wonderful amount of nuance, and that the acting and production value is very high, which does the storyline justice, in my opinion. So if you get the chance, if you're looking for something interesting to watch, something that is not an easy watch, but something that is definitely an enjoyable and thought-provoking watch, consider checking out Black Earth Rising. You can find it on Netflix here in the United States, but it is also very widely available around the world. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsnotethings.com. You can find my advice column about life at some thoughts about living. You can find out more about the tour that I'm currently on at becomingtour.com, and you can feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. My two favorite are Instagram and Twitter, and I am at Colin is my name on both of those. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.